Welcome to this National Investment Dialogue for Inclusive Business in Agriculture and Food Systems. Jointly organized by Invest India and United Nations SCAP with the support of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We are delighted to have amongst us today business leaders providing better incomes to smallholder farmers, investors that bring profits alongside impact, and facilitators, including government officials and development partners, seeking to create the enabling environment in which these firms can emerge and grow. During this dialogue, we will begin with a brief presentation. During this dialogue, we will begin with a brief presentation of the preliminary findings of the Inclusive Business Landscape Study in India. This will be followed by two panel sessions. The first will focus on the enabling environment of inclusive business and discuss the opportunities and challenges facing these types of business models. And the second will explore the ways green and agri-tech financing can be leveraged by inclusive business. For these discussions, we have united a group of experts which combined represent many years of valuable and varied experience and insights, which we hope will be relevant to your work and trigger your interest to find out more about these innovative business models. Throughout today's dialogue, there will be opportunities to ask questions and we look forward to a fruitful discussion. Let's begin with the opening remarks. I would now like to invite to the podium Mr. Gaurav Sushodhya, Vice President, Invest India, to deliver his opening remarks. Very good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Gaurav Sushodhya, and I represent Invest India. First of all, I would like to welcome you all to this National Investment Dialogue on Inclusive Business in Agri and Food Systems. Just to highlight the importance of agriculture and inclusive business, as you all know that the world population has reached 8 billion and continues to grow at a fast pace. A growing number of people means more mouths to feed and this showcases the huge impetus that we need to put on agriculture sector which has an important role to play in the global economy. India is the leading producer of several, several agri commodities in the world with over 45% of its workforce which has been employed in the agriculture sector. The sector has witnessed high growth and high profits in the previous years and has been increasing its contribution to the world food trade every year. Despite the record levels of production, the agriculture sector faces many challenges in terms of lack of infrastructure, credit, skills, market linkages and a conducive ecosystem to integrate the small and marginal farmers in the agri-food value chains. Despite the record levels of production, the agriculture sector has been witnessing a declining sectoral contribution to GDP and a stagnating farmer's income. The dominance of small and marginal farmers in the agriculture economy is one of the most important concerns that needs to be addressed during any kind of policy formulation and initiatives. The government has been trying to come up with a lot of initiatives and schemes to support inclusive business in the agri agriculture sector and to set up the required infrastructure and a business environment that is conducive for farmers and the industry to create strong backward and forward linkages. But we need to do a lot more. And the private sector has a key role to play in supporting this transformation through innovation and business models that can help farmers connect to markets, have access to technology, have access to credit, improve their technical capabilities and promote digitization, thus enhancing farmers' income and livelihood opportunities. We at Invest India have been working with all the stakeholders, including the government, industry, academia, and the farmer producer organizations for setting up the required agri-food processing infrastructure and market linkages. To these efforts, we've also partnered with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and United Nations SCAP to promote inclusive business models in the agri-food sector. A lot of Initiatives and dialogues have been, in, have been done in the past few months. Forums such as these, such as today, will be very valuable for each of us to learn and inculcate the best practices for inclusive business. And we look forward to a great learning experience today. We hope that with, with today's efforts and all of us coming together, there will be much more that we can do for small and muscle farmers and make inclusive business 
uh, a very valuable initiative in India's growth story. Thank you. Thank you, Gaurav. I would now like to invite to the podium Ms. Rupa Chanda, Director, Trade Investment and Innovation Division, SCAP, to deliver her opening remarks. Very good morning to everyone and thank you for coming on a smoggy Sunday morning <laughs> to attend this dialogue. I think it shows your immense interest in this particular topic. Uh, so, you know, let me just talk a little bit about uh, why this is an important area to focus on. From the Indian context, of course, we know that India's economy has been growing at a very fast pace. Our outlook looks bright. Yet, the ultimate test for national progress is, among others, the ability to ensure inclusive growth. And this also means inclusive growth for farmers, prosperity for farmers. Farmers are amongst the most vulnerable groups with limited income opportunities and are highly exposed to economic and climate shocks. Many are faced with hurdles to improving productivity and efficiency, connecting to markets, developing their value chains, and above all, improving their terms of trade and ultimately real incomes. The good news is that businesses are innovating in terms of how they operate to meet these challenges. Inclusive businesses are equipping farmers with technologies and solutions that enhance their productivity and enabling them to do primary food processing, introducing more sustainable and climate resilient farming practices, reducing post-harvest losses, and providing higher incomes. Inclusive businesses are different from business as usual as they put people and planet alongside profit and are therefore a critical accelerator to promote farmer prosperity. Data shows that as the revenue of inclusive businesses in the sector grows, so do farmers' incomes. Given market opportunities available for and the value provided by inclusive businesses, governments are backing the development and expansion of such enterprises. Just some examples. In 2020, the ASEAN economic ministers endorsed the guidelines for the promotion of inclusive business in ASEAN. This policy framework is now being matched by concrete actions at the national level. The Government of India is also exploring opportunities to promote inclusive models in agriculture and foodness, food systems. For example, the Ministry of Food Processing Industries has adopted measures to channel investments into the entire food processing and value chain of the sector and Invest India is promoting investments into the inclusive business models. India is home to a wide range of inclusive agribusiness models, from large cooperatives to well-rounded inclusive contract farming models and digital platforms bringing access to markets and finance for farmers. The question is how government agencies can build on these examples and create an enabling environment that helps propel the number and impact of inclusive businesses. SCAP is pleased to work with Invest India and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to explore opportunities to promote and replicate the elements that government and business leaders have used to develop commercially viable businesses that reduce the risks to low income farmers and help expand their earnings. The preliminary results of the landscape study, which will be presented here, of inclusive business in agriculture and food systems in India show that there are sizable prospects for inclusive business models in India to create value for firms, farmers, and the country. Yet, the findings also reveal that to scale up their impact, inclusive businesses need additional investments. Access to finance remains an issue for many inclusive businesses seeking to expand their operations or to deepen their impact. Today's National Investment Dialogue explores concrete opportunities and gaps to increase the scale and impact of investments in inclusive businesses at base. At ESCAP, we are committed to mainstreaming inclusive businesses as a vital means towards sustainable, inclusive, and resilient economies. Before concluding, let me thank Invest India, the Ministry of Food Processing Industries, and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for organizing this dialogue and dedicating a space to explore the opportunities that inclusive business bring for more equitable incomes. At ESCAP, we look forward to identifying measures as well as financing and investment opportunities that help expand inclusive business models that do good while doing well and to join forces to move inclusive businesses from the margins to the mainstream. Thank you very much.
Thank you, ma'am, for your opening remarks. I would now like to call to the podium Ms. Srivali Krishnan, Senior Program Officer, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, to deliver the final opening remarks. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and um, again, welcome on, uh, welcome for this particular event, and thank you for taking time out from a Sunday morning <laughs> to be able to be here. That really um, shows your commitment as well as your interest in the topic. Um, I would like to, uh, first of all, welcome you all, and including um, uh, participants who have traveled far and wide from different continents and different countries to be here today and uh, specifically looking at the topic of national investment dialogue on inclusive business in agriculture and food systems. Um, in India um, and also in Asia, when we talk about uh, agriculture and food systems, um, agriculture continues to be the backbone of the economy with significant proportion of population still um, working on agriculture and food systems for their main source of economic opportunity. Um, in India, if you look at more than 90% of the businesses, medium, small and medium, and are medium, small and medium uh, micro enterprises, which means they are small businesses. And if you look at the tagline for World Food India, which basically mentions process, progressing for prosperity, processing for prosperity, prosperity cannot come um, if we are not inclusive. And inclusivity means that we are talking about small and marginal farmers who are at the production end. We are talking about marginalized communities who will be important from the processing side. And we are talking about the consumer who again will be all the way from small to marginal, medium and large consumers. So it is important to think of inclusive business across the value chain and specifically on food and agriculture where the majority of the production comes in from small and marginal farmers. In this particular area, it is critical for us to understand that inclusive business is a critical tagline because unless we start talking about farming and agriculture as a business, it is very difficult to really make farming profitable. We cannot look at it as a social uh, good. It is actually something that is going to drive the economy and it is hence important for us to really look at it as a business proposition and not as a pure social enterprise. Um, in, this, in today's uh, National Investment di Dialogue, I really look forward to hearing more from the uh, landscaping report on inclusive business in agriculture and food systems, learn more about what, where are the opportunities what are the gaps and challenges? But also, when we talk about inclusive business and the program that we have at United Nations SCAP, that is specifically building capacity of businesses to be integrating inclusivity in their entire supply chain, entire value chain, what would be also critical is to look at what are the metrics. How will we measure these companies have been able to be profitable while they are taking inclusivity as a part of their um, processing. And going forward, what we would also like to encourage is how can we share best practices and lessons across countries, what works in a country to another country and vice versa. This is not a one-way route. This is a two-way learning opportunity and I really encourage the participants here to, in, to really learn from what have been um, successful in some of the other countries but also emulate on how do we integrate that into the existing supply chains. Um, so with that, thank you so much for uh, coming this morning and I really look forward to learning more from this National Investment Dialogue. Thank you again. Thank you, ma'am. I request Srivili, ma'am, Rupa, ma'am and Gaurav to come on the stage for a picture.
Thank you so much. Now, we move to our first session on the landscape of inclusive business in agriculture and food systems in India. This will begin with a brief presentation of the preliminary insights produced by the inclusive business landscape study being completed by Invest India and United Nations SCAP with the support of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. This will be presented by Mr. Amal Gokhale, Amal Gokhale I'm sorry, partner at IntelCAP, who has been commissioned to complete this study. I have the pleasure to invite Mr. Amar Gokhale to the stage to deliver the pre presentation. Thanks a lot, Ashika, <coughs> and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Amar, and I am here representing IntelliCap. Uh, we are working with Invest India and the United Nations SCAP uh, to undertake this uh, impact, uh, this uh, research on uh, promote, promoting inclusive agribusinesses uh, and food systems in India. As part of this effort, uh, we are assessing the landscape of inclusive businesses in the country. And the primary objective of this study is to identify ways to foster an enabling environment for inclusive business models or IDs in India. Um, <clears throat> so inclusive businesses are essentially commercially viable businesses that create social impact at scale. They integrate low income and marginalized communities into their core business operations or as supply chain actors. And they do this through innovations to provide access to goods, services, skills, or better income opportunities for, for those at the base of the economic pyramid. And as the private sector needs to contribute towards achieving the SDGs, the need to transition from traditional business approaches to inclusive business models assumes importance. And we have heard about that from our earlier speakers. And it's great to see uh, that this topic is receiving that the, the importance that it deserves. During our research process, we engaged with numerous inclusive businesses and a variety of stakeholders, government officials, investors and capital providers, and experts from enterprise support ecosystems. We did this to identify you know, the opportunities to strengthen support for inclusive businesses. And we have identified six broad themes that need to be pursued. Um, firstly, there, ne there needs to be uh, a direction through policy and programs for inclusive businesses or IBs to prosper. Secondly, there is a need to raise awareness about inclusive businesses and bring them recognition. Thirdly, there is a need to build capacities of relevant stakeholders, not just the businesses, but all other stakeholders. Fourth, enable inclusive businesses to access finance. Fifth, enable them to access information. And sixth, enable them to forge the partnerships that they need. And I'll speak about each of these uh, in, in a little bit more detail. Uh, but before I get into that, uh, let's let's take a look at what the landscape of inclusive businesses looks like. Um, our research has identified, you know, that inclusive businesses can be considered to be falling under six broad buckets. Some of which are overlapping. Uh, firstly, companies that facilitate market linkages and value chain integration, like Ninja Cart, those offering warehouse and logistical solutions such as EcoZen or Argos. Tech-enabled models focusing on certain sub-segments, such as Stellabs, for example, which focuses on the dairy sector. Uh, fourth, enterprises enabling financial inclusion, like Samunati, and those providing uh, those providing comprehensive solutions, like Argos again. And number six, those that work on inputs and production clusters, such as Sayadri Farms, or even the Exodus. In doing all of these things, these businesses bring benefits to the bottom of the pyramid either by engaging with them as suppliers, as retailers or distributors, or as direct employees. And directly or indirectly, they also provide encouragement to rural entrepreneurs and effect gender inclusion. Also, what we have noticed is that as they scale up, they tend to evolve more, from integrate, more into integrated business models, venturing both upstream and downstream, like Stellar system, for example, or even Argo system. And notably, financial inclusion is increasingly becoming a pivotal focus for these enterprises. Coming back to the six themes that I mentioned earlier, let's quickly take a look at what the existing scenario is and what are, what are some of the challenges or the gaps. Uh, when it comes to setting the direction, there is encouragement to the private sector to participate across uh, agri and allied value chains 
थ्रू से द राष्ट्रीय कृषि विकास योजना और द आर के वी वाई और द प्रधानमंत्री कृषि सिंचाई योजना और द पी एम के एस वाई हाउ एवर देर इज लिमिटेड रिकग्निशन अबाउट इंक्लूसिव बिजनेसेज इन पर्टिक्युलर एंड मोर कैन बी डन टू इंटीग्रेट आई बी मॉडल्स इन टू दीज नैशनल और स्टेट डेवलपमेंटल एजेंडाज एंड सेक्टर ग्रोथ प्लान एज फार एज अवेरनेस इज कंसर्न देर इज इंटरेस्ट अमंग गवर्नमेंट डिपार्टमेंट्स एंड द प्राइवेट सेक्टर एंड पॉलिसी सेक्टर इंडियन about business models that result in positive social impact however there is a need to put forth a very specific definition of who these inclusive businesses are what do they look like and design initiatives to support moving on i think this was mentioned earlier that when it comes to access to finance there is presence of public sector catalytic finance uh, through the agriculture infra financing facility for example and growing interest among private private investors to support agriculture agricultural enterprises indeed many of the names that i took earlier and ones that we hear that we we'll hear soon from have raised private capital however there is still inadequate patient and risk capital nbfc finance remains costly which poses challenges to ibs in obtaining timely affordable and suitable debt products when it comes to capacity building our interactions indicate that there is significant need for enhanced capacities among not just the businesses for other stakeholders as well institutional support does exist for innovators through entities like the ag hub and numerous other programs however capacities across other stakeholders also need to be built about the need the role and the impact of such inclusive businesses what we found that in some cases some of the more aware inclusive businesses are proactively working in developing the capacities of the farmers that they engage with however these businesses have limited resources and capabilities for this purpose and and they need support moving on we found that there are instances where inclusive businesses collaborate with each other and occasionally with the government for scaling up however there is limited communication across stakeholders such as between enterprise support programs and financial institutions between corporates and r&d facilities all of whom uh, are equal partners in the quest to enable inclusive businesses to grow and when it comes to access to information i think we all know about the agri stack that is being developed however as of now enterprises often lack the granular data that is necessary to enhance their inclusivity and effectively monitor the, their impact which is crucial especially when we are seeking impact capital and i think shrivalli ma'am mentioned a little bit about the impact that these businesses can have and impact measurement or rather rigorous impact measurement can be uh, a slightly involved uh, and expensive process so unless these businesses build efficient data systems they will struggle to track and report their impact so looking at all of these things we have identified as a start three things that need to be done Uh, these involve improving awareness about the institutionalization of ibs developing a framework to define ibs and facilitating access to finance to them the first will serve to elevate elevate the visibility for ibs and accentuate their impact contributions which would be a critical factor in garnering support uh, garnering wider support for these enterprises and by establishing a method to categorize and acknowledge inclusive businesses their distinct and specific requirements can be better understood which will allow us as the third one is showing to increase the flow of appropriate financing to empower these ibs to expand and indeed demonstrating that inclusive businesses can attract capital because of their inclusivity can act as an incentive for other businesses to embrace ib models i'll quickly get into all of these three uh, in a little bit uh, so when improving awareness and institutionalization it is important to take a two pronged approach one at a national level and one at, one at a state level at the national level it is important to showcase the impacts of ibs and make the importance of supporting them a little bit more apparent this can be achieved through case studies illustrating their impact conducting pilot programs to scale select inclusive businesses and similar such additionally incorporating sub allocations for inclusive businesses within relevant sectoral policies and flagship programs such as the AIF or the PMKSY that I mentioned earlier in partnership with state governments of course can advance the IB agenda governments government think tanks and apex planning institutions can be co-opted to drive this agenda at the national level at the state level leveraging existing channels to execute inclusive business supporting pilots 
through entities such as the Telangana State Food Processing Society or Ag Hub, for example, entities that we spoke to, can advance the IB agenda. Um, and co-opting such champions will help build broader consensus at the state level and at the national level for a unified policy framework. Deliberations and considerations for, for policy should run concurrently, of course, while building awareness and strengthening the business case for supporting IPs. All of these can be done by engaging key stakeholders across the spectrum, uh, you know, conducting state level conferences, innovation and impact challenges to create visibility for IP solutions and deploying capacity building programs. I think it was mentioned earlier that United Nations SCAP is already doing that uh, for certain businesses. But it's also important to engage with the wider stakeholders uh, and build their capacities. Coming on to developing uh, a framework for defining and um, identifying IBs, this can be done by creating a set of metrics to recognize commercially viable and high impact inclusive businesses, establishing a system for validating this framework, and then delineating the distinction between IBs and other enterprises. What is of importance, of course, is the impact metrics the reach, depth, the relevance, and the impact of these IBs, while of course exhibiting commercial viability and profitability at, at reasonable scale. The framework can also take into account the business model and technology innovations that these, business, that these businesses espouse, which can then serve to inform other businesses as well. Coming to the last and probably the most important aspect is enabling access to finance. It is very important to enable uh, inclusive businesses raise capital, and this can be done by exploring collaborations between existing financial institutions and low-cost forms of capital, such as philanthropic or DFI funds, which can reduce the cost of capital for inclusive businesses through blended finance facilities or through outcomes-based mechanisms. This can be integrated within existing financial allocations or established as a new fund to support IPs. Specific criteria, of course, will need to be developed to identify and reach the IPs, which won't be very dissimilar from the ones that I mentioned earlier. Separately, NBFCs can be refinanced specifically for funding IBs, guarantee schemes and priority sector targets allocated in lending to IBs, and impact capital be attracted to inclusive businesses by, by, enabling, by enabling them to showcase the impact and in the process establish the social commercial case for investing in them. It is to be noted here that impact capital need not be just equity investing, but also other forms of capital, including debt, and business structures. Such products can be channeled through Apex financial institutions, their subsidiaries, or dedicated funds. Uh, this brings me to the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening to me, and I look forward to the panel session. Thank you. Thank you, Amar, for this insightful presentation. Now, I would like to invite the panelist and moderator of our first session to take a seat at the stage. The session will be introduced and moderated by Ms. Marta Perez Cuso, Economics Affairs Officer, Trade, Investment and Innovation Division, SCAP. I would now like to invite Marta to begin the session. Thanks very much, uh, Kashika. So now uh, we will be moving into uh, discussions where we would like to engage a distinguished set of uh, panelists uh, and also we'd like to engage you and give you the opportunity to share your comments, uh, to ask questions, and particularly to reflect on these preliminary key findings that um, um, uh, Intelcap um, has shared uh, on the landscape study of inclusive business. So I have the honor to invite our distinguished panelists to join me here um, uh, at the stage. We have Mr. Uh, Shivan Vatan, Senior Assistant Vice President of Invest India. Mr. Gutan Kumar Dev, Senior Dairy Consultant at the Ministry of Fisheries, Animal Husbandry and uh, Dairy, the Government of India. Mr. Anil Kumar, Founder and CEO of uh, Samunati. Mr. Rahesh Srivastava, Chairman of ProWiz Advisors. And Mr. Rangu Rao, CEO of Safe Harvest. Thank you very much, and let's give them a warm applause.
So in, in this session, we are going to explore why and how the government of India may consider promoting inclusive business, as well as one of the fundamental be uh, building blocks for inclusive business to prosper, which is to have access uh, to finance. So I would like to start, of course, with the government of India. And I'd like to uh, start with you, uh, Shivan. Um, you invest India, it's the investment promotion agency and facilitation agency of India has been well recognized for its activities to uh, attract and facilitate investments in India. So why would it be important for Invest India to promote inclusive business? Why, why are you in it? First of all, thank you, Manda. Thank you, SCAP, and for uh, inviting uh, to be a part of this esteemed panel. So, uh, just to set the context, I'll give you a few facts. Uh, so, in India, 45% of the labor force is actually employed in agricultural and land activities. If you take that into absolute numbers, that is roughly 233 million people which are employed in agriculture. Of that 233 million, 86 million are women. That is roughly 60% of the total women workforce in India. So these are staggering numbers. Look at the absolute picture in India. Now, coming to the income group in which this sector falls in. If you look at the average income <coughs> for a typical agricultural household, it's roughly around 1 lakh rupees per annum or 0.1 million rupees per annum for the audience. Uh, that places them into you know the bottom 20 percent of the whole population. Now this to eliminate this this group into the top tier or the middle tier or to make them come up, the government of India has envisioned doubling the farmers income. And to make that happen, they have come up with a host of programs, schemes, uh, and policies to make that happen. Uh, I'll name a few of them to start with. Firstly, there is the budgetary allocation. So, how much budget goes into the various schemes and programs of the government of India? So, if you look at uh, the three ministries which look at the agriculture and the light sector, which is the Ministry of Food Processing, uh, which is the Ministry of Agriculture and Husbandry, uh, Dairy and Fisheries, and the Ministry of Agriculture and Farmers Welfare, the total budgetary allocation as a percentage of the total budget, uh, it was less than 1% in 2013 and 14. Now that, when you compare it to today's terms, it has increased 3-4 in percentage terms to around 3%. But that is a huge increase when you compare the overall figures in absolute numbers. So that is the importance that the government places in these sectors. Coming to a few schemes, the government wants to come up and improve the infrastructure, both physical and digital, uh, at the ground level. For the fiscal infrastructure, it has come up with schemes like Pradhan uh, Mantri or the PM Kisan Sampada Yojana, uh, the Agri Infrastructure Fund, the Micro Irrigation Fund. These are enabling funds which makes uh, private sector companies access uh, in, uh, funds to set up infrastructure like you know, tube wells, to set up uh, infrastructure like warehouses, silos, sorting grading units, etc. For the digital infrastructure, which is uh, equally important. Uh, it has come up with schemes like, you know, uh, the e nam or the National Agricultural Markets, or the e mandis to help uh, the private sector of collaborators to procure their equipment farmers. So, this is the importance that the government gives and is wanting to, uh, to be more inclusive and to make the businesses come the curve. Even after that, even after all these efforts, the private sector investment uh, in the agriculture and allied activities in India stands at a mere 9.3% of the total investment. So if you, uh, just to put that in perspective, if you compare that uh, in the, from let's say an advanced economy like the EU, uh, the total uh, investment in the agriculture sector is around 30%. So if you see that an advanced economy where the infrastructure is already improved uh, in EU, takes uh, around 20% infrastructure uh, investment in agriculture, there is a lot of scope for investment in India where the infrastructure is not yet built, where the infrastructure is not at that level. So there is a huge scope for private players to come. As Invest India, being the collaborators, uh, being at a very, very sweet spot between the government and the private sector, 
we see that it will be a duty bound to bring investment in this sector. Not only that, we see that there is a chance for players to generate optimal returns. It is not a social sector where there, there is you know charitable returns, but we see it as a profitable sector. And finally, we believe that in the honorable PM's vision to double the farmers' income in the next few years, hopefully. So that's why we are doing this. Thanks very much for uh, that overall um, introduction. Now, we've heard of the presentation earlier today. There were three key avenues um, if we are to promote inclusive business to start with uh, taking action here in India. One is to generate more awareness about what inclusive business are, how they are different from mainstream businesses. Um, and together with that, <coughs> perhaps institutionalize a bit more the support for uh, inclusive business, because yes, there are lots of schemes, but um, how do we institutionalize a coordinated approach for um, inclusive business? The second avenue was to formally recognize those, um, so that that can be linked to uh, promotion efforts, to um, uh, export efforts, to access to financial and non-financial incentives. And the third avenue was access to finance, no? the, how we can uh, even facilitate more uh, access to finance for those inclusive business mo uh, models and the small holders that they uh, uh, engage. In, in those three big avenues, what role do you see for Invest India? Where do you think um, Invest India? Because this is, of course, it's a, it's a government agenda. It's cross-cutting for many. Um, it will require the efforts of different government agencies. What do you see as the role for Invest India? So, um, for the general audience, I'll give a quick introduction of what Invest India does. Uh, it's a not for profit organization uh, funded by the Ministry of Commerce, and we are the National Investment Promotion Agency of the government. So, our whole mandate is to bring in investments into the country, be it the agriculture sector or any other sector. Now, how we can help in promoting inclusive business? By a threefold approach. Uh, firstly, is to uh, firstly is information discovery. Now, a lot of private investors, a lot of companies, they don't find investable opportunities to put their money in. That's where we come in. We have suitable mechanisms. We have uh, information discovery platforms within our company. Like there is a platform called the India Investment Grid, which hosts investable opportunities on its platform in various sectors. So an investor can go on the website and click on an investment opportunity and directly connect to the to the partner who is implementing an organization and put money there. Secondly, we connect the private sector with the government. So that's where you know we are specialized in cutting through the bureaucracy and cutting through the layers of the government and bringing the connection directly between the private player and the government stakeholder which is implementing the scheme and putting uh, useful connections in place. Second method is basically to do capacity building. Now we have within our company various uh, teams such as there is a one district one product which is uh, a national skill now. The ODOP team, the one district one product team is doing capacity building in various districts on the ground uh, including for agricultural products uh, and, and, uh, and food producers. Uh, they are doing certifications for organic productions they are doing design workshops so that the food can be packaged better, can be designed better. They are also doing capacity building to raise the awareness of how to export those products in global markets. Uh, another team of us is called the Startup India, which is working with the startups to find them their niche in this, in this sector, including the agriculture sector. And again, doing capacity building in various remote areas, such as Ladakh, in, in North East, in Jammu Kashmir, where there is a lot of opportunity for people. It's a typical agrarian economy. So it's a lot of opportunity for startups to work in that space. And we are doing capacity building. And thirdly, inclusive business is another pillar that we want to work in, in the future, hopefully. And in this direction, we are, we are working with uh, SCAP, we are working with the uh, Melinda Gates Foundation. And we have set up this, as Amar mentioned, we have set up this uh, inclusive business forum where we are uh, you know, partnering with various agri-tech startups, agri-tech companies, coaching them. Uh, we are working with, uh, we are doing workshops with central and state governments, with NGOs, with industry, with academia. And that's where we see a potential for this, this space to come up in the future. 
And finally, we, we hope to come up with a metric to evaluate these companies in the future to, uh, for them to be financially viable and to connect them directly with the private sector and to connect them directly with the farmers on the ground. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, very much for being very specific on, on uh, what could be the role of Invest India in, in promoting inclusive business models. Um, now I'd like to move to Mr. Gautam uh, Kumar Dev. Uh, you represent uh, another government agency. You're a senior dairy consultant at the Ministry of Fisheries, Animal Husbandry, and, and Dairy. Uh, and you're a seasoned expert in the, in the dairy uh, industry uh, or subsector, which plays a, a very important and increasingly important uh, role in, within the agriculture uh, uh, sector. And I, I'd like to um, hear a bit what the, the role that the, the ministry has uh, been playing in fostering collaboration between public and uh, private stakeholders to promote the dairy industry in a way that is inclusive and sustainable, particularly for small <coughs> farmers. Uh, good morning, all of you. Uh, in fact, uh, among all uh, agriculture uh, uh, you know, sectors, uh, dairy is one of the most developed se sector, I can uh, assure you. And uh, dairy uh, composes of uh, uh, approximately 75% of small and marginal products, which is already in use. So, and uh, woman participation is substantial. Uh, in cooperatives alone, it is 30% here in the industry uh, roles. But women direct participation is refused. So, approximately about more than 2 crore farmers, I mean 20 million uh, farmers are uh, involved in the organized dairies. And uh, if we look at total uh, our figures, around 80 million, out of 80 million, more than 20 million, uh, and out of that, 75 million, uh, 75 uh, percent. Uh, small and marginal farmers, those who are having less than two hectare basis, really uh, can be called inclusive. And if we look at uh, private partnership, yes, uh, uh, earlier uh, uh, only the cooperative uh, government used to support cooperative initially when dating was not that general. And uh, we could develop cooperative uh, a long time, I mean, from 1970s to Day. And then thereafter, uh, of, of course, we had a uh, policy uh, uh, framework for uh, private uh, dailies or private sector to, uh, uh, you know, to have uh, in the mainstream, uh, so that they can also you know, increase their business. But after 1340, uh, things have changed. So most of our schemes were earlier grant-based schemes. And we had barely any space for uh, um, uh, private players. Uh, although we had some FPOs and FPCs, but in, case, in fact, FPO and FPCs were not uh, existing in the country in that way. And, uh, uh, but after 2018-19, uh, a lot of initiatives were taken. Especially if we look at 2021 project uh, Animal Husbandry uh, Infrastructure Development Fund, we directly in, the, uh, in our scheme, this was specifically made for private and entrepreneurs. So that, uh, and we had 15,000 crore uh, project, uh, so one of the biggest project uh, for uh, in dairy sector or in animal husbandry sector especially. And uh, this was for uh, feed manufacturing in dairy process, also wheat process. So this is one of the uh, largest schemes that uh, the department runs. Then thereafter, of course, in, even in cooperative system, our procurement, their procurement guidelines were such that they are, uh, always there have, there have been, uh, you know, tie up with private players, especially the equipment manufacturers, the uh, laboratory equipment manufacturers, the raw materials, other feed manufacturing. So all these were, uh, in fact, uh, included or uh, in the system. So, private model is there. But off late, Interest India is working with us, even uh, here in the Get Foundation is working with us, uh, Ernst Young is working with us, Grand Swan is working with 
us. We have specific budget in our uh, schemes uh, as it was placed here uh, for babies. And uh, our all the schemes, uh, if we uh, look at not only HIDF, we have other schemes like uh, National Rastri uh, Open uh, we have a national program for the development. Uh, we had recently a national daily plan. Now we are framing up national daily plan too. Uh, we have a uh, uh, assisted program. All those schemes have inbuilt provision for FPOs, NGOs, and uh, entrepreneurs, SFGs. This is completely, we made this inclusive and put budget for that. So that there are provision for inclusive issues. So we are working uh, with the private. Now we have started working, of course, off late maybe for five years. But we are trying to uh, increase this, uh, increase the private presence. But this is required. Uh, hopefully I can answer it in your next question. These are some of the schemes that you are have put in place, uh, the ministry has put in place to support investments in the in the baby uh, sector. Um, could you maybe share with the other uh, programs that you have, and, and, and we can see a trend towards promoting more private sector investment, which is as Sri Bali was saying, what we want to see more of. Um, with uh, agriculture, it's not just it's not a social activity; it's a business activity, and, and, and something where there is an economic opportunity for business to make a profit, to support economic growth, but also to make a difference for the small for the farmers. Now, in addition to investments, small um, in the dairy, small for the farmers also need access to support uh, in the development of their business and uh, technical. Uh, um, access to technical resources, to uh, linkage with markets, um, to, to know how of the business. Could you maybe share what are some of the work that the, the ministry is doing in this regard to support um, small uh, holders in, in the dairy sector? Uh, if I uh, explain some of the programs, I think it will be more clear. Uh, so HIDF, I already mentioned that we are working on uh, working with private and entrepreneurs. Similarly, uh, our national uh, program for daily development, we talked about, we are providing uh, laboratory equipment uh, right from the farm uh, and then uh, main collection center to the processing center. So uh, this is uh, on sharing this. I mean, government of India provide some grant and uh, as the organization, is a beneficiary, I mean, if you are corporate, they uh, share their part. So, it is uh, uh, the ownership that they take. Now, laboratories are the laboratory government. Then we have uh, a lot of, uh, we are providing bulk milk coolers in the rural area. So that our coal chain is uh, complete because milk is very simple to that. Uh, then we provide uh, uh, then under this project uh, project ICT uh, network. I mean we provide servers, with computers, softwares, so that they can have the product traceability and quality system in place. So uh, funding is also what we provide for. We. Uh, in fact, uh, we provide uh, technology to the uh, mid collection centers, actually, which is owned by the farmers. There again, we provide uh, automatic mid collection units so that uh, payments are, uh, we can see, uh, it is transferred. So can see it transferred. Now, AMC use laboratory equipments, all that I, I already mentioned, those are already manufactured by private. Not even open So they are associated with directly or indirectly. It is happening now. And again, uh, if I look at private dairy industry, so this is happening under uh, uh, a more or less similar uh, fashion, it will it is under, uh, happening in other uh, uh, dairy infrastructure. 
your business model, how, how it develops, and, and then um, we'll move into more specific questions. Thank you, Mata, um, and thank you for uh, inviting me for this discussion. <coughs> well, uh, Safe Harvest was uh, formed by eight farmer organizations. Uh, and um, the idea was that these farmer organizations, uh, for quite some time, were into sustainable agriculture and into cultivation of crops without the use of synthetic pesticides. And, uh, while doing so, uh, the missing link was uh, being connected to markets because uh, post-production, most of this, these commodities were going into mainstream uh, market channels. Uh, so there was no real identity to this produce. And, uh, and that's, that's when Safe Harvest was born uh, by the same organizations who were working with uh, farmers in different states and in different geographies of India. Um, so, the primary, uh, let's say, the motive or let's say the uh, goal of the organization is to connect farmers and farmer organizations to markets and to provide uh, that linkage uh, because these farmers are in very difficult geographies and it's very difficult uh, to kind of uh, access, let's say, uh, formal uh, organized uh, markets. So that's the pri uh, primary goal. Uh, the second uh, priority is to help farmer organizations and farmers to climb up the value chain. Uh, the understanding is that if farmers continue to uh, deal only in primary commodities, uh, the uh, chances of actually uh, you know, accessing remunerative prices uh, remains very low. Uh, and then uh, adoption of any kind of sustainable practices would be that much more difficult. Uh, so their primary source of livelihood is agriculture and if agriculture does not remain remunerated, uh, then probably people will move away from agriculture itself, uh, let alone sustainable agriculture. So that's the uh, second uh, goal of the, of the company. <coughs> And the third is uh, related to consumers, uh, where we feel that um, you know uh, consciously produced, minimally processed, safe food uh, <coughs> is to be provided to consumers, uh, especially in the domestic market, because historically uh, entities who have been engaged in uh, uh, safe food uh, marketing have been looking at uh, exports and external markets. Uh, so the third uh, primary uh, motive or let's say the goal of the uh, company is to make this available to domestic markets and domestic consumers. Uh, so that's the basic uh, model. So we primarily buy, source our commodities only from farmer uh, organizations. So from 8 we have grown to 30. Uh, we have grown in terms of the commodities that we deal in. Uh, we used to, when we began operations, we were dealing in about let's say about 15 or so commodities. Today we deal in more than 55 and this is thanks to farmers and the farmers associated with our, with our partners. Um, and in terms of value chain, uh, we find that many of our partners have climbed up the value chain. Uh, there are a few examples and if time permits I will, you know, I can actually elaborate on that. Uh, who have climbed up the value chain, who, who had started with uh, only, uh, you know, providing us with uh, primary commodities and that to farm grade material uh, and they have gone into cleaning, grading, uh, primary level processing etc and then providing us uh, with the material which has, it's, it's like a win-win solution uh, because uh, my inventory cost goes down, my cost of uh, you know holding that particular material goes down by, whereas we are also able to you know, pass on uh, higher share in the consumer to our uh, farmer organization. Uh, so that is, has been made possible, so it's, uh, let's say, you know, these are baby steps in, the time, in trying to achieve uh, what we have set out to. Uh, and that's the kind of the business model that we have. Thanks, thanks very much, Rango. And now, as an inclusive business, um, maybe if you can tell us a, a bit about what have been your uh, financing needs and your, um, how, 
have you been able to uh, address those financial needs uh, for you and for those organizations and small holders that you engage about uh, on, on the value chain? Uh, <coughs> well, um, the business that we are in, uh, which is agri-commodities, uh, and uh, we are in the business of marketing, uh, we are a brand, so you know we are trying to sell in the market. Uh, so it, this is a very, uh, you know, it's an equity and debt model. Uh, because uh, the procurement of commodities, the processing of commodities cannot be on equity base uh, because as you know equity is expensive and uh, so it has to be debt driven uh, in terms of most of our back end sort of requirements uh, and that is not easy uh, because we are a very small company. Uh, earlier uh, the problem was uh, because the mandate was to procure only from farmer uh, organizations and farmer organizations which are into sustainable agriculture. I cannot just go to a, a mandi or you know to any kind of marketplace to buy whenever my requirement is. I have to go to specific farmers, identified geographies, etc. to purchase. And my farmers are small farmers and uh, they have very low holding capacities. Uh, so if I don't buy at the right time, let's say post harvest or something, I may lose access, I may not be able to buy so because my farmers would uh, sell to anybody you know, in the market because that's their primary source of income. Uh, so uh, there is uh, financing needs because you buy at a certain time, you sell across the year. So I have an issue of inventory. Uh, so apart from you know, being burdened with the cost, it's the first is the cost of procurement itself. Uh, <coughs> Uh, so, um, over a period of time, what we, uh, you know, when we began, uh, my, some of my FPOs probably were better positioned to access finance because of uh, the presence of, let's say, like-minded NBFCs and also um, uh, NABAR, which is the biggest, uh, the largest of the agencies uh, in India working with uh, uh, farmers uh, and agriculture. Uh, so, NBCs and NABARD combined, uh, the FPOs could uh, access and we helped them access that. Uh, we played a role in that in terms of because the FPOs were not in a position to prepare business plans, uh, make projections, etc. Uh, where Safe Hour stepped in and uh, proposals were strengthened, etc. and uh, they could access these finance. Uh, because, uh, you know, the company has been formed by FPO, so there is, we are uniquely <coughs> placed in some ways, uh, unlike other companies, because uh, there is a level of trust in the system. So there were tripartite agreements uh, where this debt was built into the books of the FPOs <coughs> and the material was made available to us and we underwrote uh, that particular debt and we paid and we, you know, met the conditions of the, uh, you know, the lender. <coughs> That was one model and the other was direct, uh, you know, because the company also apart from procurement required funds for its uh, working capital, etc. And we were fortunate to actually be able to, uh, you know, access funds from formal financial institutions, although, you know, we were at that time a loss making institution, uh, we still remain so, uh, unfortunately. Uh, so, and uh, that has helped us to some extent. Uh, the third was the uh, the issue of identifying like-minded investors. Uh, one is my shareholders are FPOs, and secondly, you know, we went underwent a crowdfunding, and third is my primary investor who has majority stakeholding today in my company, who uh, you know there is a kind of meeting of minds uh, as far as reaching out to farmers is concerned and uh, we could access uh, equity, uh, you know, uh, fortunately uh, from uh, this like-minded investor of mine. And uh, we have been able to kind of, uh, you know, be in this uh, sweet spot as far as equity and debt is concerned. Uh, debt has been, you know, while speaking, it, it looks easy, uh, but it has been a very, very difficult journey uh, because uh, accessing formal, uh, you know, debt from formal institutions is today still remains 
a difficult task. Although, you know, some of my partners have been, uh, you know, have managed to do that uh, over a period of time, but for a majority, uh, you're still dependent on NBFCs, on very expensive debt uh, that we, you know, and but you, you cannot do without it because the business is such uh, where I call it expensive debt, but it's still cheaper than uh, equity. So, you know, you go ahead and you do that and you, over a period of time you try and become more efficient in terms of use of uh, the, you know, the money which is available to you. Uh, if debt was cheaper, probably the business would have been, you know, pretty good. Okay. So, uh, uh, two, two rounds of questions. Uh, based on the, on, the, on the challenges and your, on your experience, where do you think um, it's uh, support from government or action from government would be most valuable uh, to support inclusive businesses like yours or to encourage um, the development of uh, new inclusive business models? Well, as I earlier spoke, finance is one place. Uh, it has to be much more innovative, much more imaginative. Uh, if that is available and, uh, you know, uh, it happens through participation from both sides, when you come up with such, uh, you know, products, uh, that would definitely help in kind of furthering the business. That's one part. Uh, the other is, uh, is in terms of the technology which is available today. You know, it's very, very... Uh, scale friendly, friendly, and it has remained so. You know, the higher you go up, uh, you get economies of scale, you get better technology, you get you know processing, the quality of your product is much better, uh, etc. So this is available to say large players in India today, uh, or let's say the world over. And uh, if the government is uh, looking at small entrepreneurs or small businesses to grow. I think technology is something that has to be worked upon because let's say a simple thing like uh, processing uh, lentils, pulses, you know, and converting it into dals or let's say wheat into wheat flour or patty into rice. Uh, mills today do not, you see, you have to access third party mills because you cannot be spending your capital or investing into setting up because your requirement is so low. So you end up going to these uh, millers and processors. Uh, who are not keen on taking your produce for milling or processing because your scale is your volumes are too low. Um, and you end up going to low tech, uh, you know, millers or processors and uh, you end up getting a lower quality or let's say your, you know, your recovery rates are lower. So your product becomes more, you know, expensive. So technology is a very major uh, sort of area that ha needs work and it can only be done through research and there has to be a focus which has to come from the state. Uh, it, I don't think uh, the private sector will uh, or is in a position to do such, uh, such work. Uh, so that is one area I think uh, which needs immediate attention. Uh, the third is in terms of uh, you know, building capacities of farmers and farmer organizations. I think that's a very important area to work in uh, because, uh, you know, most of these smallholder farmers organizations are in very difficult geographies and uh, businesses requires skills. It's not just about production of a particular commodity. Uh, uh, and uh, those skills have to come from the outside, you know, in the sense that they can be owners of that business, the farmers, but the managerial part has to be built, built uh, you know, done by people who have those requisite skills. And uh, they need not or necessarily are not from the same region. They have to come from somewhere else. And that is a very difficult task to kind of bring the two together. Uh, so the managerial role is what is lacking in, in most of my, and I can speak from my own experience of having worked in tribal uh, areas of Central India and also now with my experience of safe hours, that that is a very difficult area. I think that's more difficult than finance also, uh, to get uh, the, the human resource required to uh, run and govern uh, these uh, professional you know, entities. And uh, because people are not really interested in going and working in these areas. So, and I think that is somewhere where if these organizations, these FPOs are supported uh, through the kind of 
what Amar talked about through the kind of models which are, you know, both come from charitable or, you know, grants and, uh, you know, business sort of funds. Uh, that kind of uh, imaginative sort of combination is what is required by these organizations because uh, smallholders, if they don't come together, there is very little negotiating power that they enjoy. And uh, that is an extremely important thing, especially in a, in a country like India. And that is where the state has to come and help uh, and do that because those capacities, that environment is very important. So I think skills, technology, finance, uh, that's how I look at. And the third is definitely uh, in terms of if you're looking at inclusive businesses, uh, you need certification, you need that kind of build up in terms of, uh, you know, from the consumer side. Uh, you know, there are many such certifications which are available today. You know, look at organic certification, with how it has been built over the years. Something similar sort of work has to be done. It has to be completely recognized by consumers. There has to be much more trust uh, building which has to happen there. And once it is done, I'm sure, uh, you know, the whole process will hasten up. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you very much for sharing your, your views on how to make this uh, actionable uh, and meaningful for more uh, businesses. Let's talk now uh, with uh, Mr. Uh, Anil Kumar, the founder and CEO of Samunati, uh, another inclusive business. Uh, Samunati is an open agri network that seeks to um, unlock uh, Indian agriculture, working with small holders and putting them at the center. So Samunati is working to um, with the uh, entire value chains and support uh, providing both uh, commerce solutions uh, but also finance uh, solutions. So maybe if we can start and you can share how you're supporting and providing financial solutions to um, meet the needs of the small holder farmers. Thank you, Martha. Morning, everyone. Wonderful to be here and wonderful to see many friends uh, in, in, in the room. It's definitely worth a Saturday evening travel from Chennai and a Sunday morning here uh, in Delhi. Well, uh, you know, the impact report, Amar uh, uh, has given many, many ideas. Thanks for some of those uh, points that you made that my, my own idea of sharing few thoughts have got uh, a, a little uh, elaborative, I would say. Uh, Samunati as an entity focuses on the entire agri value chain as Martha mentioned. I'll just add some numbers to it so that you know that uh, what we are doing is at a reasonable scale. We are in 23 states, work exclusively with uh, collectives on one side and their members and the agri enterprises on the other side in the entire agri value chain. The uh, FPO next that we have as the, uh, as the platform has about 5,500 FPOs there. And uh, we also work with about uh, 4,000 agri enterprises on the on the other side of uh, you know, of, of the agri value chain. Together between finance and commerce, we have done about uh, 20, 22,000 crores of throughput, about a, a little over two billion dollars of throughput. Well, so one of the key takeaways for me since morning is uh, the definition of an inclusive business. The more I'm Looking at the definition of an inclusive business, the more exclusion I'm, I'm realizing in terms of how we as uh, the players, I'm, I'm basically introspecting. When I say we, I, I mean only me. Uh, I don't mean anyone else in the room or on the dais. Introspecting as to why, why do we keep talking about inclusive business? Why do we keep talking about this inclusiveness? And the more I'm realizing that the more there is exclusion is when we keep talking about inclusion. And this one size fits all that most of we as the bankers take as an approach is not is not going to cater to the inclusivity that the sector needs because the players in the sector are heterogeneous. So let me just take uh, the product structuring as one dimension to, to articulate uh, what I mean here. So if you take product structuring and you take the one size fits all, which is what most of we as bankers do, is where we get into vintage of the existence, the profitability track record, the turnover requirements. You know, Rangu mentioned that we are not a you know profit-making entity and we continue doing so. But knowing knowing safe harvest for 
very many years the kind of impact that they have been creating on 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 the communities that they work with is phenomenally valuable so if you take profitability as a driver of or as a requirement of uh, underwriting an entity from a lending perspective say farmers would get excluded so how do we include which means we have to exclude profitability as one of the parameters for for underwriting to vintage we see a lot of energy in the startup ecosystem and we did talk about ag hub as one of the entities amar in your presentation and, and and fortunately in the indian landscape now we have a host of incubators that have come up in the last few years and the moment you put 3 years as the as the vintage of existence so you will invariably exclude entities that are doing phenomenal job but are not old enough as per your criterion of underwriting from a vintage perspective right and you take turnover as a criteria you take rating as a requirement uh, and and I'm, i'm very very happy to share that one important wrinkle in the uh, in the in the guarantee that nabard has nab samrakshan from a rating perspective got removed uh, or amended rather recently by by the uh, ministry of agriculture department of farm and welfare where an entity that is categorized as non bank finance company lending to the farmer collectives which are not rated entities had to be triple a to access the guarantees right so it's it's a huge wrinkle why why do you need uh, the entity which is lending to be triple a rated when you are actually fostering the flow of credit to unrated entities unintended so that has got modified to triple b now because there are only 13 triple a rated nbfcs in the country out of a, 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 you know I, i guess of about 14000 nbfcs that 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 we have and these 13 entities are not predominantly in agriculture so that has got modified to now triple b there are many such things but suffice it to say that when you are looking at inclusive business and from a finance perspective including businesses in your larger scheme of things the first approach is identifying and understanding why are their exclusions and in the product construct that samunati has we realize that working capital structures are usually excluded from the bank funding to agriculture and we are talking about pros- you know processing lead to prosperity how can you have processing without working capital you need working capital and you 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 have term loans term loans are good for equipment finance you know term loans are good for project finance but the but the project to run needs lubricants and working capital structure is a fundamental lubricant required for businesses and working capital by definition need to be customized to suit the working capital cycle of the business should range from a day to 45 days 60 days you know 90 days as the case may be in terms of what the working capital cycle is for that specific business you cannot have a one size fits all right second vintage you know how, how how do you make sure that your products are designed to cater to budding entities to established entities and you certainly need to be cognizant of the risk management when you are lending because finally you are borrowing from somewhere and lending and hence you need to be cognizant of uh, getting the money back right so just to give some examples of how the product structure again samunati has been approached from this dimension is we we have approached our underwriting from a non traditional perspective not from a traditional dimension of vintage profitability tax returns bank statements and what have you done in the past because all of this are like looking into the rear view mirror and driving ahead we don't believe in that what we do believe is can we underwrite the transaction if for example i am an aggregator as as a entrepreneur uh, a startup in the agri ecosystem and if i am looking at aggregating maize as an example and supplying to a a, a food a animal feed manufacturing unit and if i am underwriting that transaction from a from a bill discounting perspective from a receivable discounting perspective whether the entity has done 100 transactions or is doing the first transaction does not matter because all that matters is whether the maize is going from the seller to the buyer because you are underwriting the receivables from a buyer 
So we have approached it from a dimension of underwriting the transaction. So specific to, since you had sent Martha notes prior to the session, specific to some of the product examples that, that you suggested that we share. On the collective side, we have given that FPO as a collective is also new as an entity. We have a product called, well, we are in the cricket season, but it has nothing to do with the naming. We have a product called IPL. It is, it is instant pre-approved loan, which means when an entity gets registered, and we have, uh, friends, we have about 1,500 such loans, not a small number. All that it requ requires is have you as an entity got registered as a FPO or FPC rather. And if the, 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 the board of directors who have come together as a founding team are willing to put their neck on the line with their personal guarantees, we give a 5 lakh rupee loan with no questions asked. You need not have even a week of vintage. And, and, and the narrative that we have there is, if you are united, we are committed. You cannot say, I am not going to put my neck on the line, but you put your money, no. Even there, right? it is a huge leap of faith that we are taking because people with no track record are coming together. And this product has been around for about a uh, little over two years now. And I'm happy to say that this product is, is, is working extremely well. Once you have a, and most of these loans, by the way, are three to six month loan, depending on what is your working capital cycle. These are not traditional uh, term loans of uh, equated installment structure. They are working capital. You need money to basically kick off your operations, and that's the duration that you need. And then you have loans graduating for that. You know, we have IPL Plus, where if you repay successfully and you show your commitment with the same structure, we will have a little larger loan because now there is a track record that you have created and track record does mean something between a lender and a borrower. After your successful completion of IPL is when we get the first product that we had prior to launching the IPL which is called SAN, Simplified Assessment Norms. Can we simplify the assessment because the requirement is, is smaller? Can we say just one year of vintage, a little you know transaction history to know that you can handle goods and cash and have the capability to you know to to run your operations and loans up to 25 lakhs uh, 2.5 million indian rupees are usually under the simplified assessment norms and then we move to non-san non-san are the ones which are mature entities with large exposures where loans could be a crore and above right so we have basically taken the dimension of taking calibrated risk while appreciating that uh, all the entities may not uh, satisfy one single criteria. So is the view that we have taken for lending to the members of the of the farmers. We have a loan called Safal, uh, Samanati Farmer Loan. That's about it. Then Safal, where uh, we provide loans based on the recommendation by their collective. We don't engage with farmer without the farmer being a member of a collective, where. Uh, the, the, the collective basically does two things. One, refer the farmer to us, and two, uh, takes the responsibility of engaging in monitoring and servicing. There again, the exclusion is the moment we say farmer loans, only two products come to picture or come for discussion. The Kisan credit cards and the crop loans by the banks. Go back to the principle of exclusion. If both these, both, both these products are sufficient, then we don't need to talk about including the farmers in a lending program. Right? So the, the latest of our launches, again, going back to the acronyms, is the SAI loan that we have, which is Samunati Agri Infrastructure Loan. And this is one product that we are looking at aligning to the Agri Infrastructure Fund sooner than later. Uh, but then this loan is basically for processing and, and Soon after the session, I would indeed be sitting with Jitin to look at how do we take their cooling solutions to the FPOs uh, uh, because that's a that's a catalytic infrastructure and that requires a equated installment structure. So, concluding this particular question, yeah. go back to why it needs to be an inclusive approach by recognizing the fact that the client's requirements are heterogeneous. So, so thank you for yeah, highlighting and giving very specific examples of what Rahul was saying of needing innovative financing uh, solutions. 
in addition to access to finance, uh, small holders face other uh, issues. Um, what are the issues that Samonati is trying to address in, in your business model? Martha, first and foremost, we exist to make markets work for smallholder farmers. That's the purpose of our existence. And anything that can make markets work for smallholder farmers is something that we engage in. Well, we, as you know, I, I have spent 32 years in banking, so the first thing that, that, that uh, we embarked on was lending, because that was something that we understand. Debit credit space is something that we understand, so we embarked on lending. Soon we realized that Lending alone is important but not sufficient and hence we got into the market linkages or the agri-commerce that you mentioned. And agri-commerce also lends to a lot of de-risking the lending business because if the collectives are, if, if our clients have access to reasonable markets, then our ability to recover money is that much more certain. So we got into market linkages. Then we realized that we have to solve for the dimension of access. So I'll, I'll just step off the beaten track a little bit and mention that while we talk a lot about the fragmented land holding and smallholder farmers, the agri ecosystem is also equally fragmented. Right? It's fragmented among multiple subcategories. The input guys look at the agriculture from their input lens. The post harvest uh, players in the ecosystem look at from the dimension of after the harvest. Banks and financial institutions often look at how do I underwrite so that I am safe as, as, as a lending entity? Most of the government schemes are designed around both the vehicles in terms of banks being the vehicles as well as, uh, as, well as uh, uh, you know, reimbursement as the process of giving the loan for the, or giving the subsidy from the uh, utilization, so on and so forth. So from a farmer's perspective, if you put yourself in the shoes of a farmer, it's always difficult for me to engage with each of these fragmented players in the ecosystem on their own when I am myself a smaller holder. So all of us when we look at inclusive approaches have to look at from the farmer's perspective can we solve for the dimension of access. Access to finance, access to markets, access to infrastructure, access to information, access to technology and access to advisory services. If we look at solving for this dimension of access then the rest of the process becomes much more easier because now we are looking at looking at farmer at the center with solving each of the challenges that the farmer has thank, thank you and I, I see that i have not been doing a very good job in the end of timing uh, but i i'll just want to ask you for one one suggestion that you will have where if you were a government um, agency, where would you put your efforts to promote more inclusive business? What will be your priority number one? I include private enterprises. Because most of the government schemes don't include private enterprises. NBFCs are not included in many, many 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 interventions so i i would request that we focus on the on the outcome of why a certain intervention is being designed or being looked at you know scaling than the vehicles you know th there are many many entities that are there that can provide access to the beneficiaries of those schemes including private enterprises and and if the last slide of uh, the, the uh, report is to be spoken. If there is money at 8%, which is available, Rangu and I would have scaled up this 10 times. right? Though we are good friends, we have not been working together because what he needs is cheaper money. What I don't have is cheaper money. Today, my current borrowing is 13%. And just to share with you, when we started in 2016, when I got my first 1 crore rupee, rupee loan, I borrowed it at 21.5%. Because it is my entity, I did, you know, take that uh, risk. Today, my borrowing is at 13%. And if you are including Amar DFIs in that, while DFIs are lending at 6, 7, my hedging costs are equal to that. So all the DFI money for me is anywhere between 13 and a half to 14 and a half. Now, what do you want me to do after that 14 and a half percent I borrow? 
and I am not having access to cheaper money, I have to, I have to lend at least above that. So include us in guarantee programs, include us, include us in subsidized programs are very, very heartening to see that you are talking about refinance. If refinance lines from, from, from large entities like SIDBI and NABAD are opened up for enterprises which are NBFCs, that would be great. And Martha, the last point is we have seen in the Indian landscape how creating a separate category of entities in the affordable housing called NBFC HFCs facilitated flow of affordable and required liquidity to the NBFCs in the housing. 2010 onwards, in, you know, creating a separate category of NBFCs called NBFC MFIs facilitated flow of cheaper money and required quantum of money to entities that are microfinance institutions. Perhaps it is a time for us to examine if there is a separate category of NBFCs called NBFC Agri, so that lending to NBFC Agri becomes priority sector for banks. NBFC Agri's entities automatically qualify for NABAR finance schemes, automatically qualify for you know all the guarantee programs that the government have and become uh, become distribution partners. That would be great. And <laughs> all the four entities which are supporting this may want to examine if there is merit in in, in this. Excellent. Thank. You. Thank you very much for the very concrete uh, suggestions and um, this links very well with uh, our last speaker, Mr. Rahesh Srivastava, uh, who is the, currently the chairman of Progress Advisors, but he is a founding member of Rabobank in India and therefore has extensive experience in investing and financing for food and, and the business. So uh, we've heard of uh, how the, the um, landscape for investment and financing is moving. Maybe if you can give us your uh, views on how you have seen this evolution and how it's maybe opening up or where we could be looking next for promoting and supporting more inclusive business in, from an investment and financing side. Thank you, Martin. First of all, thanks for inviting to you and to Invest India. Uh, so before I start, uh, just in a lighter vein, uh, he uses a lot of acronyms and, and you know, abbreviations. So I have one just point for him as well. I think I call it USB. You know USB, right? So understanding a successful banker. So maybe that's good. So you know what? Uh, speaking in the, at the end is both good and bad. Uh, and good because, you know, uh, you have you know, seen a lot of people speak and you can pick up a lot of points. But the bad part is that lots of them have covered lots of what I want to say, right? And Anil in particular. But anyway, um, so first of all, um, I haven't, in India, Rabo Bank has been more or less a wholesale banker since uh, uh, beginning and then that's what I did for many years and then into private equity, but that investment also was into mid-market, uh, you know, food and agri enterprise. But let me give you a, if you allow me, uh, just a few, you know, broader perspectives before I jump into your question. First of all, uh, I think it's uh, very heartening to see a lot of people said about agriculture not being just a social enterprise or sustenance occupation. I think agriculture should be agribusiness. And when we started in Rabobank, I think this is the phrase we had that agri we always call food and agribusiness. We never said food and agriculture. And if you look at India, I think the journey is transitioning agriculture to agribusiness. That's what we should be uh, aiming at. Um, again, just to just to put some numbers and just throw a perspective. Uh, if you look at the look at the credit gap, a lot of money flows into agriculture, of course. But honestly speaking, I call it compulsive financing. If you look at the public sector banks financing in India, it's largely because they have to meet that 18% quota within 40% of priority sector, which they want to do. And they have to show that, demonstrate that. If they have it, if have any part of that quota going, a begging, then that's deposited into NABA or SIDBI or some of these low yielding, you know, uh, pockets, which is not good. So, compulsively they do it. But what they do, I think what the banks, and I've been a banker, so I'm sorry if I'm, I'm, I'm don't mean to denigrate anybody, but at the same time, this this uh, fact, 
what the banks do typically they finance tangible assets uh, it's largely tractors or maybe implements maybe something else where they can see that you know this is the asset this asset based financing which happens uh, at best it will be land or they'll want collaterals but quite honestly as anil said very clearly i think what you need in india is a lot of lot of structured solutions uh, i am not just saying blended capital i am saying structured solutions because you know there are so many segments uh, of of borrowers where you need different kind of solutions and he said very clearly that you know one size doesn't fit all so you need to devise that uh, quite honestly if i look at a very glaring gap in our country within our banking community that's a lot of skilling required orientation required for bankers to actually get into this this habit and this role of assessing each borrower separate in i'm talking agri business i'm not going beyond and i'm including food processing in agri business by the way a definition just to call agri is a pretty pretty smallish definition honestly because i firmly believe that you inject money equity or debt at any link of the value chain the benefits they definitely go down or go up and they transition through the value chain to everybody so consumers are as important as farmers and farmers also are consumers by the way so it it kind of gets into this uh, uh, common field i think the numbers are astounding uh, we did a study in ministry of food processing some years ago uh, and the credit gap in food processing was something like 20 billion dollars this is 2017-18 and i did that uh, in my my team and the ministry's team did it together so it's authentic numbers maybe more certainly can't be less if you also add the gap in the agri credit side it won't be less than this probably more than that but even if it is equal to that you have a 50 billion dollar credit gap in india so what are we talking about if anybody says that we met the needs of the agriculture or food processing i think they are just talking somewhere in in up in the air that's not true uh, i can also say that clearly because honestly speaking the assessment methodology of of um, general banking not somebody as accomplished as as someone we need more of you by the way and and more of you means more bigger samundati and many samundatis in the country to to cater to the needs but if you look at the the way it works is that the risk assessment uh skill within the indian lending community investing community is very little actually because quite honestly most of us most of the banking community does not understand the risks which are accompanying the food processing or the agri sectors seasonality is policies uh, global geopolitical all of that comes into play whether of course it's just one of them which is important and now the climate change which is again something important unless the bankers have the ability of assess that risk and price that risk it's all very superficial uh, thing we're talking about so that's that's the key but having said this a 50 billion dollar credit gap is quite honestly is also an opportunity if you look at it so i think anil mentioned uh, something which is very very uh, right as well the you know when you talk about pricing uh, affordability the cost of capital i think the before that is availability is the credit really available to the bottom of the pyramid that's the key question because you know talk of fpos very good emerging i mean you can't that is the model i think we all spoke i think it almost like saying that everybody is talking about fpos doing this fpos doing that and clearly you need that the fpos to be the really the fulcrum of actually delivering a lot of products credit uh, access to market talk of anything you come to fpos unfortunately the bigger model of fpos or the best model of fpos could have been cooperatives which have not been successful in india i'm not talking about mool and a few uh, runaway uh, names but clearly coops have not done that so i must touch upon matter the the credit delivery 
mechanism in India. And that's important because, you know, you talk about money coming from wherever it's coming. The question is, how do you really deliver it to the bottom of the pyramid? That's also the question. Banks, NBFCs, MFIs, they're all different models or different vehicles. Some are not being run efficiently and some are non-existent. Some are dysfunctional. I think one of the best credit delivery uh, vehicles could have been the PACs or the primary agriculture credit societies, which are there approximately, approximately equal to the number of villages, maybe a bit less, four, four, four lakh or something. But so many PACs existing in India, and they are, most of them are dysfunctional. And, you know, if you create something new, it will take time, it will also reinventing the wheel. Whereas you can revive, galvanize them into action, mobilize them into, into efficiency and get them well. So, message for Mr. Dave to take back home. The PACs have to come alive to let this sector prosper. Uh, the other point I'll make and then I'll leave it to, to her to uh, raise supplementary questions uh, is that, you know, when we talk about uh, agri-financing or investing in agriculture, uh, and I said it clearly, uh, I think we're talking about inclusive, and I and I'll describe the inclusivity uh, or exclusion uh, uh, very effectively. I would touch upon another subject of, of which is goes hand in hand is impact. I think everybody talks about impact uh, by you know lending to agriculture or food processing. I think by its very nature, agriculture <coughs> is impactful. By its very nature, the the quantums may vary from case to case. But in any case, this sector is impactful. It will be affecting, impacting life of somebody in the system. That's how I take it. Uh, the question is, can you measure it? How do you measure it? Metrics. And all that is something which is still there. And you mentioned a bit in your, in your PPT. I think going from here forward, Invest India and IntelliCAP and UN uh, SCAP, I think take on a few other points which the panel here said and expand the universe of your study. That's important. I think one thing which is, which I find very, very important is access to markets. We should come out much more strongly and effectively. Because any FPO, if it works just for access to inputs for its farmers, I think it's half the circle. You've got to complete that virtual circle unless it also does the market linkages or access to markets is leaving something like like appetite half addressed that doesn't work so that's the key other half which has to be taken into account let me stop here uh, and get back to you thanks very much and uh, being conscious of the limited time uh, that we have i'd like to open the opportunity for our participants if they will have any uh, question that they would like to post to uh, one of our panelists, or if they would also like to share their reactions to uh, to the presentation. So if you have a question, if you could leave your hand, and we'll make sure that you get um, a, a microphone. <coughs> yes, the, the gentleman uh, there. Uh, and if you can kindly introduce yourself.
so I think the, the discussions around today have been more around the entire ecosystem, what the government is doing, what the industry is doing, what, what we all as a part of this entire ecosystem need to do. It is not about you know, showcasing any faults in any of these stakeholders. It is about how we can progress further with more suggestions coming forward from the government, from the industry, from academia, and also from public digital organizations. Um, thank you for this. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll make it quick. I think we all agree on the importance and opportunity for SPOs. Sorry, if you could even uh, use this other Sorry, I'm Jitin Galani from Promethean Power. Uh, we provide cold storage solutions to farmer communities. Uh, we work with five FPOs today. I uh, plan to do 20, 20 FBOs over the next five to uh, uh, 12 months and scale up further. All of us see huge opportunity in FBOs. We also see the challenges. Uh, I think what we need is uh, maybe the next step is a blueprint. Uh, how do FBOs get started? Uh, where do they focus first? Um, and what is their path to success? Uh, because if they have that blueprint ready, uh, we can do thousands of FBOs over the next few years. Uh, I'm very inspired by Rungu, we have not met yet. Um, you can talk to people like him to see what are the obstacles, he's covered some of them. If we all come together, we can galvanize a huge, huge movement. Um, but I think that sort of blueprint, the way forward, how do they get started, initial loan, next loan, these are the things that are very difficult for people to put together. Um, and I think the people in this room could really take a big step forward if we did that together. Uh, thank you very much for that very concrete uh, suggestion. Um, anyone would like to? Uh, any one of you would like to react, or maybe um, uh, share if um, of blueprints or, uh, that you've used in the development of the FTOs? <laughs> Yeah. So FPO is a very a new concept, uh, of course, in especially livestock, we have started afresh. Ma'am knows it, and uh, I mean, Bill and Melinda Foundation, CII and uh, BCG is doing. We are also, we have taken up uh, work, but it's not very easy. We need 10,000 FPOs, and we have started. Uh, few have been done. Someone, some of my colleagues here said that working with maybe five, six hundred FPO or four hundred FPOs. So, but ten thousand is a big, big picture, and it take it will take long time. Uh, personally, at the moment, I am working with uh, uh, FPO one FPO in Ladakh. We are trying to uh, create one FPO in Highlands uh, for the pastorals. So I understand this is not very easy. It, it, it needs the support of the government, state uh, UD, state government, and other stakeholders. So I have been finding it difficult to f get funds. Now we are searching where from we I can get fund for uh, those pastorals because they are very poor. They do not have forward or backward linking. Some forward link, of course, they have through vaccination and all, but market linkage they do not have much. So they are exploited by many you know individuals or so, traders. So we are trying to uh, get fund uh, from the, uh, for for them. So it's very difficult now, but still we are trying to get. Uh, fund from uh, government uh, uh, resources, from other some uh, private resources, wherever it is possible. I, I agree to what he said. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And um, I think this is, and I'm sure that there are agencies that are, there are a number of schemes to support FPUs. Uh, and this is part of the uh, program of the government of India. So we'll be happy to collect some of those experiences, at least as a starting point. Um, in, the, in the landscape study um, because it's, it's one of the elements to, to make a music business uh, successful. One small point of this FPO thing is, is that, look, uh, first of all, I think, uh, I think many speakers have spoken about that, is the fact that FPOs have to be, first of all, treated like a business. You know, it's like a business entity. And uh, this cannot be, uh, you know, this entire business cannot be one, you know, reaching a target or supply based. Businesses are 
probably get started on demand based when you see an opportunity and uh, if that is not a fundamental sort of understanding uh, when we kind of form an FPO also, I think FPOs are bound to fail. Uh, so I think if we start from there and we see that there is an opportunity and there is an opportunity for farmers to come together or for any kind of uh, agriculture community because pastoralists are also there who get into farmer, you know, organizations, producer organizations, etc. And if they see an opportunity of that kind and then I think from there we can carry on. So fundamentally I think that is where we should uh, begin from rather than beginning from the point that we have to make 10,000 FPOs. I think then uh, the whole thing gets into a completely uh, different track. Okay, thank you for reflecting and this is a very ambitious goal uh, of 10,000 FPOs. Um, and, and, and recognizing the, the work that it takes to really uh, support um, only one. Uh, last chance for one. Woof. <laughs> okay, please introduce you quickly and, and just one question. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pilar Jimenez from the Exports Promotion Bureau of Chile. And I listen to all of you and like uh, alert my attention. Uh, we are talking about uh, about uh, inclusive business, and I I think I never heard about the gender or uh, woman in this agriculture business. <laughs> okay, let's take like, the three questions and then uh, I'll give you uh, this yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Okay, uh, two more. The two other gentlemen. So I think like I've been working with some FPOs. I think I'm audible, so we have been working with some FPOs and some inclusive businesses also. But then what you touched upon affordability is comes as I mean say for you that is also a problem for them that is also a problem. So I mean say what is the level of affordability? I mean say what's the rate of interest where do you see? I mean say that is something we call as an affordable. Government of India is one side where you can get support on, but I don't know when this will happen. But how do you see the role of other stakeholders, be it like investors like BMGF or other impact investors who can come together and then develop or design some affordable solutions which are kind of suitable to meet requirement of both FPOs and enterprises and also I mean so you need not to go over 13.5 kind of something. So so that's something I want to ask. Okay, perfect. And the, the, the last question, and then you can choose. Uh, yes. uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ashish Paliwal. I work with Kathaba Agri Science. Uh, in my past, I was working a lot with uh, a lot of countries, and I was working with, for example, Scandinavian funds, Scandinavian pension funds, Norwegian funds. They have a lot of funds, and they don't know where to invest. Mr. Rajesh Shivastav, he was, uh, uh, he's with uh, Rabo, so he knows that very well. Billions of dollars waiting to be invested. I do not understand what should be done that these billions of dollars can fill in the gap of 50 billion dollars gap. That's my first point. Number two, today we all are coming from outside Delhi's air 468. Somewhere 668. I do not know how many hundreds, but I cannot see beyond 100 feet. What to be done? If I just would like to bring your attention on one point, this agricultural waste being burned in North Indian states can actually run a ship, can actually run aeroplanes in a form sustainable shipping fuel, sustainable aviation fuel. I had the pleasure in the past talking with some of the biggest uh, uh, renewable energy companies who are like 50,000 crores, 10,000 crores, I don't know how many thousands of crores, they all are willing to invest. The only problem, where is the feed stock? And it takes me by surprise that 1.5 billion tons of agricultural waste, 1.25 billion tons of agricultural waste, whether it's 600 million tons of agricultural waste, 40% of being surplus, then why is everybody talking about that there's no feed stock? So these are a few things which troubles me. So if any one of you might like to throw some light over that. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. So three very good questions. Yeah. So first of all, the lady, uh, you asked a question. 
I'm 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 not a I'm not an agriculturist myself, but I'm certainly an agri banker, so I can I can say something. To you. I think everybody would know, and Mr. Dave would bear me out. In dairy, for instance, I think half the workforce, actually, I'm talking small farmers, dairy farmers, is actually women. They are the one actually who look out of the animal. The farmer goes to the land and he does with something else. It's the women of the house actually who to take care of the animals, you know, rearing, feeding, cleaning, whatever happens. That's one. Also in the processing industry, in fisheries for instance, you see a lot of women force. I'm sorry nobody specifically mentioned it, but hats off, I think there's no gender bias here at all in agri and food, absolutely. Nothing at all. Maybe more in some other sectors actually. Agri food is perfect. So compliments. Uh, the Can I respond to that? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, first of all, my sincere apologies that women were not mentioned because I feel just like any other sector, here also their participation and their contribution goes unrecognized. Uh, <coughs> in agriculture, he mentioned about dairy. In agriculture, 80, more than 80% of the work is done by women. Uh, I think uh, the role of men is glorified in agriculture. Uh, you know, you see any picture, you see anywhere. Farmer means male, but I think it's completely, it's completely erroneous because I think 80% or 85% of the work on a field and off field is done by women. And I think we should accept that and probably we should have made a special mention of that. That's all I want to say. Just on uh, feed, you said uh, government is, of course, uh, uh, they are trying. I mean, government of India, the Punjab, Delhi, all governments are trying. Even from our department, uh, we are also having our projects and some work is also going on. Some uh, industry entrepreneurs are already there for compressed uh, uh, fodder. So, because fodders are cut, uh, because there, there is no, no much time in this transition from uh, you know paddy to wheat so uh, but still uh, there are some entrepreneurs who have come up uh, working on that even uh, boiler briquettes so those are uh, work is going on and other products are also being uh, made but of course uh, for uh, you know covering all it, it will take some time yes thank you ashish to your point uh, i think first of all as you know the agri waste or the residue is enormous. Just the paddy straw in these northern near states is about 37 million metric tons a year. It's not small. All over India is 100 million metric tons, just paddy straw. There will be wheat straw and other things which come by. Uh, by the way, there's a lot of work happening, not just at the government level. Uh, also, I did a project for the Dutch government actually, where we studied the burning issue, which is, you know, we see the dark clouds today, the smog. And actually speaking, it can be converted to many things. Ethanol, power, fiber, boards, what have you. So the study basically was that how do you commercialize this? And not only that, also set a formula that the farmers can be rewarded adequately. Otherwise, how do you collect that year on year? And inherent, I won't go into it, not the forum, but a lot of work actually went into studying that how do you really clean up the fields because it's about 40, 45 days window at best between the two seasons that you need to clean it up. The mechanization of it, the whole economics of it. And we created a new institution which will come into uh, knowledge of everybody. It's Biomass India. That's for promoting this, something like Nabad for agriculture. We want to create that in Apex institution just for this agri waste to value. So that's the, the steps are being taken and we're collecting uh, this thing. One other question on your financing thing. Somebody, you mentioned about the, yeah, you mentioned about this, uh, so much of, uh, you know, and as you said, pension funds and all of that money is lying all over. I think, uh, you know, there's money all, all right, but he mentioned about the hedging cost. So you get, uh, money at 5-6%, at 7-8% of hedging, it comes to the same 13% for him, doesn't work. I think what should happen, I think, and there is this exchange problem, forex problem which actually causes this. 
some institutions like IFC, for instance, and ADB, they have a special dispensation that they can do rupee lending. So they absorb the hedging cost, actually speaking. More of these institutions, especially the DFIs of other countries, Scandinavian, Sweet Fund, all of that, if they also get the same kind of treatment in India, I think automatically the cost of funding will reduce for sure. So those are some of the things which can be done uh, quite effectively. Uh, deployment of money, uh, if agri can be portrayed and can become agribusiness, why not? Food processing is a great, great sector to invest into and I think we're trying to do and other people mentioned agri-infrastructure. I think Shivam also did and others did. Uh, actually, agri-infra, frankly speaking, uh, short of this a lakh crore, which the government of India has set apart, and that's for uh, different things. Private capital has not really gone into agri-infrastructure in the right way. And that is a you know, yearning for private capital, which I think should happen. So that's where the large funds, pension funds and all can easily get deployed. Cost and, and the question was directed towards me. I'll just give two perspectives cognizant of the time. So it'll be very, very brief. There is one project called Magnet Project in Maharashtra. This is between Maharashtra government and uh, ADB. And Samanath is one of the uh, approved uh, lenders in that. There, the funders are giving us money at 6%. And the requirement is we don't cross 12%. So if somebody can cross-subsidize the cost of borrowing, then you know it's easier to make uh, affordable, uh, make make the lending affordable. Second point is there is also a necessity to see the opportunity cost, and what is it that you are paying as the interest, as against the margin that you are making is an important one. And we at Samanati have a specific training program that is designed for all the FPOs on the opportunity cost. And there is one example that I would not give you now, but outside because I will take more time on how lack of awareness about the opportunity cost results in loss of income for the FPOs when you have the ability to make more money. I'll have a bilateral conversation with you. Excellent. Thank you very much. And with this, I will really like to wrap up this dialogue. And I'd like to give a big round of applause to all our panelists. Thank you very much. <laughs>